I just want to say welcome. I'm really pleased to see a good group of people here, um, and I think we're going to have a, a nice conversation. Uh, so, so I'm I'm just wondering if you would like to talk a bit about about what you think some of the biggest challenges are for the China in the in the coming future, however you want to define that, for for Chinese people on the one hand in China and for the Chinese government on the other hand, because I'm not sure those challenges would be the same. Sure. Um, and you're right, it is a, an encompassing question. That yes. Go in a lot <laughs> of different ways, but I'm happy to, it's a really interesting one. In some ways, it's the question that runs through the, sort of, that was the problem that I was trying to <clears throat> address in, in my book and in my work, which is, what does it mean to be Chinese in 2017 and beyond? And, um, you know, I think from the, if we talk about the government's perspective for a minute, you know, they're, they're, they're torn quite clearly at the moment between on the one hand saying we are something unto ourselves. We are a, a completely unique civilization. Um, we can be informed by others' experiences, the way that we sort of, chose a little bit from the buffet of socialism and then discarded a lot of the other stuff that was available. Uh, and they feel sort of, I think, that they can do some of the same uh, with this era when it comes to technology. How much do they want to participate in global norms when it comes to w what the internet will be and what it will not be and how much will people be allowed to speak freely and how much will it be a borderless expanse and, and so on. Um, and yet at the same time, I think at their sort of most fundamental level. If Xi Jinping was sitting with us here, which would be a great get, by the way. That'd be quite <laughs> a good but I think he would probably say that, um, no, China will not, China is not and can never be a country like every other country. And on some level, it's a sentimental point of view. It's not an analytically grounded, there's no reason why China needs to be unlike other countries. But I think it is deeply entrenched in, um, in his conception of the future that it will never be like other countries. And that poses actually something of a problem because you know, up until November 8th, I suppose, I would have argued that we're moving inexorably in the direction of a more cosmopolitan um, globalist ethic. And that if you want to be modern, if you want to be cutting edge, if you want to be a leader, which is a sort of abused word, um, that you, you have to participate without reservation in the international system. And I, I'm not convinced that Xi Jinping in his heart of hearts and his generation is prepared to participate, generation of, of uh, Communist Party officials is prepared to do that. Um, from the people's perspective, it's a version of the same problem, which is ultimately where do you place your loyalty? You know, do you place your loyalty to the party, to the flag, to your family, to yourself? And um, that question, there was a sort of holiday from that question for 30 years because people placed their loyalty in, as Deng Xiaoping ordained, uh, development above all. Development is the only hard truth. And at a certain point, that formula became unsatisfying, I think. And that's the problem that people face today, is what do, to what do we aspire, you know? Um, and it's not like there's one kind of easy answer. The way that there might have been an easy answer, you know, at one point the answer was revolution or the end of, or the, end of the imperial system. Um, but today there is no single coherent answer. It seems like, I mean, development is also an untenable goal forever. Yeah, I mean, totally. you, can't, you can't have the same kind of pace of growth and, and satisfaction the, yeah. the, the, or, 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 or dream, I guess, yeah. for everybody. Yeah, you quite literally can't from a development perspective, from an economic perspective, because <laughs> it doesn't distribute resources in a way that's sustainably fair. And then on top of it, it's killing you. You know, right. quite literally, right. people can't live in an environment in which development is the only thing that's putting, um, that gets sort of total support. So that's the, that's, the, that's the predicament, I think. That's sort of the modern Chinese dilemma. Mm -hmm. I should say, by the way, at the you know, if I was thinking as you were saying at the beginning, this I'm in this position now of writing a little bit about 
China and a little bit about the United States and a little bit about other subjects. And they sort of relate to each other in a funny way, which is that um, I found myself you know, moving back to the United States in 2013 after being abroad for 10 years. And um, in that 10 year period, I had uh, sort of almost, um, without meaning to, I'd become a bit of an evangelist for a, a certain form of American politics. And I think this was partly because I was living in authoritarian countries, but um, I had come to believe essentially that for all of our idiosyncrasies and flaws and quirks, um, that the American democratic system was a defensible export. And then I really, so I would, you know, sometimes I would, I would, I wouldn't do it too aggressively, but you know, I, I basically believed that to be true. And then I came back to the U.S. in 2013 and moved to Washington D.C. And it was a little bit like I, you know, I was somebody who'd been kind of studying gorillas from afar, and now all of a sudden I was Jane Goodall living in the forest. Uh, and in some ways, um, you know, I still believe very firmly in the idea that, you know, in, at its philosophical origins and in the, the way that it gives um, essential deference to the individual, that is still something that is an American, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an idea worth um, celebrating and worth uh, promoting. And yet I also think that we have done um, a, a lot of damage to, uh, I think John last night mentioned in, the, in his introduction, of, you know, the way I wrote about it recently, which is that we've done a lot of damage to the sort of moral glamour of democracy, to the moral charisma. And uh, for that, we have a lot of work to do. Because right now it's, you know, it's summer vacation for the autocrat they get to feel that the pressure is off because there is no appealing alternative. So in that way, I find myself still struggling with the same question, which is, um, you know, how shall we live as a, as a political people and as a group? Um, and the answer is not as clear as I think I thought it was four years ago. Do you find that the, um, that the experience of, uh, of, of watching the Chinese leadership has, is instructive as you, as you seek to interpret American politics these days? Yeah, well, well, for one thing, it just looks really tame and <laughs> sort of predictable. Uh, you know, living in Beijing, we always used to think, God, it's so wildly unpredictable. I have no idea what's going to happen next. And now, actually, it feels like I know I have a pretty good sense of what's going to happen next. You know, uh, 19th Party of Congress will happen, and there will be a reasonable degree of variance among the individuals involved, but it'll be a fairly predictable sequence of events. Um, no, I, I mean, I, I think though, uh, yeah, I guess I, I mean, I have come to see some similarity in the way that, um, in the way that American politicians at the moment are struggling with this central question, which is how much do we open ourselves to the world and how much do we not? Um, and I mean, just on a practical level, also, I never really thought that the issues around elite corruption, nepotism, and things like that would, that, that I used to rail against in China uh, would suddenly be quite so local uh, in their nature. Um, I happen to live a few blocks from Ivanka Trump, so it happens to be uh, much on my mind. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I should open, uh, not monopolize the, yes. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about the third. The third topic on your, uh, the, in your book, uh, Faith. Uh, could you say something about um, religious tolerance, the state of religious tolerance in China right now? Sure. Um, yeah, it has really fluctuated quite dramatically over the course of the last um, 10 years. And there was a, a high water mark, I suppose, for religious tolerance probably around 2006, 2007 when I remember going to um, house churches that were underground only, you know, in name only, and they had large, very public profiles. Um, you could walk in off the street and attend a service in downtown Beijing. The local police probably constituted some not insignificant number of the congregants, but um, it was a companionable 
existence with the local authorities. They had figured out a way to, to coexist. And then that began to change. And I, I think it began to change for a couple of reasons. One, um, there was just a, 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 an institutional allergy within the party to the idea of institutions taking on, becoming the vessel for other people's loyalties. And so it, as they got bigger and, and they, they just sort of hit the limit of what some of the institutionalists and the traditionalists in the party would accept. And then I think um, that was one reason. And then I also think uh, there was a level of nervousness that was generated from, for other reasons. You know, the income inequality, corruption had really frayed the nerves of senior party leadership. And for that reason, they were less inclined to be tolerant of other things. And so in some sense, it wasn't religion per se that, that generated these antibodies, but it was other forces. Um, to the point that you then saw this pendulum swing back and, and there really was um, a clamping down on semi-organized expressions of religion. All that being said, you, it, this is a little bit like trying to hold back a tide. I, I, I think that the, the urge uh, for religious activity in China is profound. There's a new book uh, which is coming out right now by Ian Johnson, um, who's a friend and a really great uh, student of Chinese contemporary religious activity. And, um, I'm going to see him in Washington this week. But for people who are interested in that subject, the souls of China, souls plural, is, uh, is probably going to be the best, um, you know, the best update on that that we'll see for a while. And his view is, is essentially that you can't prevent people ultimately from, from trying to um, define for themselves moral meaning in their existence. And uh, so this, but the state will at various moments try to prevent it or shape the sort of the course of the river, even if they know they can't dam it entirely. It's more a yearning, uh, you say, across the country almost immediately because of new information and so forth. But the, the, uh, the, the economic growth and economic uh, security or whatever uh, is not in consonant with it necessarily. Uh, so can you talk about these tensions and what it does in different provinces where it has co more coincides the other parts? Yeah. Do not, thank you. It's a really interesting question. In some ways, you know, we wonder, it's really a question about whether yearning for faith, how does it correlate to um, economic opportunity and, and whether they are, uh, whether they have a relationship. And what's interesting is in China, I've experienced both kinds of, um, uh, I've sort of been to both kinds of faith communities, very rich and very poor. So at the very poor end, I mean, some of the poorest people I've met in China are the most religiously inspired. You know, I've been to churches that were in essentially old pigsties where um, people are, um, you know, they're looking, it's almost a, a desperate devotion. You know, they are really looking for something or somebody to save them, to remove them from their, from their ordeal. But then at the other end of the spectrum, I've met people in, um, you know, in downtown Beijing and Shanghai, in particular, a private equity executive who um, was in the midst of this kind of extended, long-running religious safari where he was just sort of going from one different tradition to the next, trying them all out. And it was a status symbol that, it, that you had the, the wherewithal and that you had the space and time and that you had the international experience to be able to even imagine a religious life at all. So they served different functions in their lives. But I never got the feeling that um, that those two were in competition or conflict with each other. Uh, one interesting example, which I mentioned, if folks who have read the book will, might remember a, a, just a brief aside um, about a guy who I know who's a reporter uh, named Lingu, who um, really was a kind of social butterfly. He was always running around town, talking to everybody. He was a classic reporter. As he said, you know, he never turned on his stove because he'd never eaten a meal at home. And then I lost track of him for a little while. And I asked a friend, I said, what happened to Lin Gu? And they said, oh, he, he became a hermit. And I said, what do you mean he became a hermit? And they said, yeah, he's, he's a hermit now. And I said, oh, okay. And I was trying to think, how do I get in touch with a hermit, you know? Um, 
well, it turns out he has email. So the hermit's <laughs> email was still functioning. And I emailed him and I said, you know, subject line hermit or something. And I said, Lingu, you know, where are you? And he said, well, I've, it's exactly right. I have moved up into the mountains of Shandong and I am uh, living a very different kind of life. And he said, but I'm going to come downtown. I'm coming back to Beijing to see my mother pretty soon. So let's get together. I'll meet you at the corner of the you know, subway stop at Yonghegong, blah, blah, blah. So we meet. And he's a very funny, droll guy. And he's, we meet, he, you know, he comes up out of the steps of the subway. And he's wearing brown robes. And his head is shaved. He's not a monk, but he's a hermit, which he, he explained the distinction in a minute. But he said, um, first thing he said was, I'm a cliche, aren't I? The middle class Chinese hermit. And uh, I said, no, you're not a cliche. Oh, this is really interesting. And, and then he sort of talked me through what was going on. And in a way, they are related in his experience because you know, he ran up against the outer limits of what it could mean to be a journalist. He was frustrated by the fact that he would never be able to be a journalist on an, in an international sense, you know, without censorship, being able to pursue whatever leads he wanted to pursue, all of those kinds of things, because he was hemmed in by the Chinese system. And so in a way, his response, his resort, uh, he resorted ultimately to saying, all right, I need to, I need to look for a very different way of sustaining myself. And so he kind of went inward. And instead of having this very um, socially involved life, he said, I'm, I'm just going to sort of uh, look for answers elsewhere. And that is related in some sense to your question, I think, because it's about as you open up opportunities in your life in one way, um, are you ultimately satisfied or not? Yes. Yes, I'm. <clears throat> I'm interested in what's going on economically in China. I'm a little bit confused about it, <laughs> as uh, I I read about the tremendous growth, yeah. and uh, and how they're getting into trouble with the growth and the real estate properties and all that, and uh, and yet they seem to be doing very well scientifically and all that. Uh, uh, how is this all going to shake out in, 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 in the future? Some, some articles say there's going to be disastrous things happen. And what is the story about that? Are they overgrowing? Yeah. So it is uh, your right to be confused because it's a mixed picture. Um, anybody who tells you that they have a single unified theory of the future of Chinese economics is, to quote a friend of mine, either knows a lot more or a lot less than I do. Uh, and because it's not, it's not um, there's no reliable indicator at this point. But I'll say a couple of things which I think are, are useful, incredible data points. One is um, it's never going back to the double digit growth era. That period is over. And whether or not you think that's a good or bad thing, that's just going to happen. They're now into a new phase of growth where um, they've done a lot of the catch up that was available to them uh, in terms of, of making up for lost time. Uh, missing out on the Industrial Revolution in some sense. Um, um, but they've also run out of things to build in quite that way. And they were very clearly, and you see this reflected in all kinds of economic indicators, they're now, they built things that they didn't need. So there's overcapacity and steel and a whole variety of other things. Um, housing in some places. They have housing in the wrong place, but not in the places where they need it. Um, so that means that they have to make this shift. Uh, it's probably not going to go off a cliff. That's, you know, for every once in a while, whenever, particularly when the, uh, you know, when the capital markets begin to go haywire in China, you get a series of stories in the press that'll say, China's economy is kaput, it's, you know, this is the end, and it's a real misreading. I mean, the people who follow this in a serious way will say no. The underlying structural dynamics are unchanged. The capital markets don't really have any relationship to the underlying real economy anyway. They're sort of a gambling market. So, uh, and, and the state of financial regulation is, is pretty primitive. So in a way, uh, it's not useful to look at the stock market as an indicator. Um, it's not going to go off a cliff, partly just because there are a lot of poor people still trying to get from the countryside into the city, full stop. I mean, as long as you have that dynamic, you still have um, a pretty strong engine for future growth of some kind. You're not going to have 6% growth forever. Uh, you may have something a lot less than that. Um, but the reason why China is not a giant Greece 
or a giant, uh, you know, Malaysia uh, in 1996-97 is that unlike other places, China's debt is mostly on shore. It's mostly inside the country, and because China has been so protective of its own system, it means that it has extraordinary levers of control over the economy, which means that it can it can forestall or postpone or sort of mortgage a lot of the economic trouble that other countries have to deal with right away because people come calling. Um, so for that reason, China can, it's both good and bad. It means it can probably prevent the barrel from going over the falls. On the other hand, uh, it also means that it's able to delay making what are really necessary economic reforms to come up with a more sustainable economic model. So uh, what I would say is, you know, the safest bet on China's economy at the moment is it will be a gradual downward decline to a more normal phase of growth. Um, it, it, you know, it may have dips, but I don't expect it to drop into uh, sort of to, to drop into an immediate and sort of sustained collapse the way that the Japanese economy did, for instance. And maybe the other the other piece there is also that with an authority an authoritarian state has considerably yeah. greater authority to be able to, yeah. to guide and shape yeah. the, no, the direction true. of the economy. I mean, look, they own the banks and they have tremendous control over. Uh, interest rates and over the other sort of instruments of of, uh, of economic policy that other countries don't have the luxury of controlling. So, um, and then I mean, on, a, on this, just let's get into sort of economic or, or political economy terms. Is they can prevent, for instance, money from leaving the country quite easily. They just shut it off and say, all right, we're not going to have a um, we're not going to have a uh, we're not going to have capital flight of the kind that other countries might have. And they can also prevent people from moving into the cities in large numbers if they want by controlling household registration and other things. So there are all of these tools at their disposal which may not be good for political satisfaction and for, um, for other things, but do allow them to kind of keep things from boiling over. Uh, Hi. Um I teach here in the East Asian Languages and Cultures Department. Um, yesterday, you said you hope your son will learn Chinese. I think, I think that's what you suggested. Um, we would like the children of Kansas to learn Chinese, um, in particular the incoming freshmen. Um, so I wondered, you know, firstly, if you think it's important that you know, US universities have graduates who speak Chinese and understand something about China. And if you do, um, and you were in front of not us, but 4,000 incoming freshmen, what would you say to them to encourage them to study Chinese and learn about China? Yeah. Um, you know, this is, uh, it, it, you'll see in my answer why I, I, I emphatically agree, but this is a little bit like asking a unicyclist if they think unicycles are important. I mean, I happen to think studying Chinese is one of the greatest things that you can do for yourself just as a person, as a mind, and then also professionally, if we want to be kind of cold-blooded about it, which is a useful language to, to use for, you know, incoming freshmen thinking about it. Look, I, I think there's no question that, um, I'll, so first the arguments against it. The argument against it would be, well, what's the point of us investing in a language that, when China is learning English so fast and has so much of a reason to do so, it's this international language that um, has already taken hold and so on and so on. Why should we be spending our time and our money on Chinese? I, I think one of the answers is that a, uh, a low level of Chinese actually returns high dividends when you get to China. As anybody here who's studied Chinese knows, if you go and you make a sincere effort, even a few words, um, it buys you some credibility. It gives you an opportunity to forge a relationship that you wouldn't otherwise have. The second thing is that it gives you a level of, this is the obvious sort of, the meatier answer is that it gives you a profound sense of the place. Just Right off the bat, you can't understand Chinese culture without, without really beginning to try to unravel the language. Now, granted, you know, um, it'll only take you thirty years to master Chinese, um, <laughs> but uh, but it is it is the only way to really begin to not to say that you have to achieve fluency or anything, but it's the only way that you'll really begin to understand one fifth of the world's population is if you'd make a, a serious effort to try to understand the language. I, I think. Um, uh, on the cold-blooded level, I wouldn't be sitting here if I hadn't decided to study Chinese as a sophomore in college. You know, I just, the level of professional opportunity that it creates for you is, is really unparalleled. And, you know, there's a whole lot of ways that you can create opportunities for yourself in life by acquiring a hard skill. 
hard meaning concrete. Um, you know, so if you learn to be an accountant, well then, you, you know, you can be an accountant. If you learn to study Chinese, you can go to China and do all kinds of amazing things. And so in a way, I kind of look back on it with, uh, you know, it was a fortunate, and I wish I could say, you know, expertly planned um, strategy, but creating a huge part of the world to which you have access is um, an investment in yourself that you'll never have an opportunity to do again. So if I was a freshman uh, sitting here, um, I would, you know, on one side of, uh, uh, there's a side of your mind that says, look, if, if, if you study Italian, you'll get to spend the rest of your life eating good food and, you know, doing uh, uh, long research trips in Tuscany. <laughs> However, uh, if you study Chinese, there is uh, an entire world of professional and intellectual and, um, and entertainment options available to you as a person that you just will never be able to equal by doing anything else. Dennis. So I, I have a question based on uh, evening conversations I have with executives in China. So I've been going for 14 years for three to six weeks each summer teaching. Yeah. And so across 10 or 12 of the provinces. And uh, what I've noticed in the last few years in the evening conversations where I think I learn much more is kind of a growing concern from the executives of the kind of change in the social structure, less people being willing to marry, less people willing to take care of their parents, even an envy of the American social security system, which is odd. <laughs> and the other one, the reaction between the under 35s and the over 50s to Xi Jinping's crackdown, mm. where with one you see almost this fear the cultural revolution is coming back and I have to be very, very careful. With the others, kind of an optimism of the entrepreneur and, you know, I can help, right? You know, and so I'm just wondering if you observe that and what you would share about those issues. Oh yeah, each one of those is a really interesting point. And actually I think, you know, each one is its own important um, bucket. I, I guess I would say one of the things that unifies some of the observations that you made is to what degree are um, people in the, we'll call it the decision-making cohort in China right now. So people who were, you know, born in the 50s, uh, maybe early 60s, um, but really people born in the 50s, Xi Jinping being the, being the principal um, example, sort of how much are they shaped by that history and what does it make them aware of? So, you know, if we're talking about, you know, social security terms, it's people who say, well, look, I was, I'm of a generation where, you know, you were always supposed to be able to support your parents in old age, but those bonds have now broken down both economically and socially, and those traditions are not quite the same. Um, then uh, when it comes to sort of how you interpret Xi Jinping's use of authoritarianism, uh, is very much informed by the experience of the Cultural Revolution. I, I think um, I mean, one of the things that this always, this kind of observation always reinforces with me is that when in doubt and you're trying to make sense of, uh, of a Chinese sentiment of one kind or another, it always makes sense to go back to the Cultural Revolution and to look at what that experience both reflected and then generated, because it reflected certain underlying things in China um, that still uh, that still haunt the politics, which is the ability to move large groups of people in an irrational direction under the certain under the right combination of leadership, and that freaks people out rightly today. Even. Not just Chinese, it freaks people out here too. Um, but. So when people have seen what Xi Jinping was able to do, creating essentially a, a, a kind of cult of personality and uh, identifying enemies among the people, and, um, that I think they're, they are right to be concerned. Um, on the other hand, it's a very different place than it was in 1968. You know, you, you couldn't do a lot of the things, or 65, and you couldn't do a lot of the things that you could do then uh, in China today simply because it's now stitched into the world. So, but I, I guess I, I, I often found myself in China as, as a writer, I'm often drawn to people of that generation, exactly the generation you just described. They're the ones who are doing, they're making the biggest, riskiest bets in one way, you know, both on the upside and on the downside. So a lot of the entrepreneurs that I ended up hanging around with um, were people who had been through that experience. And so in some sense, it taught them life is short Nobody's going to help you but yourself. 
and you have to look out for yourself. Um, on the other hand, it also, uh, it also bred in them, a, I think, a, a fear of political dynamics on a broad basis and what it can do. Um, so it, it created a, a slightly self-protective impulse, I think. So I have a follow-up to that. Yeah. Because did, did I observed some of them talking about how do they get visas abroad? How do they get different citizenship? How do they move their money? How do they get their ch children raised abroad? Yeah. That's kind of a hedge <laughs> yeah. in case they need to get out of Dodge. Totally. Did, yeah. So I guess. Oh, that, absolutely. I'll give you an example. I mean, I had a, an interesting case of this where I went to go see somebody who had been newly named the richest person in China. And is a woman named Zhang Yan who uh, she at that point was. Um, well, she was of exactly the generation you're talking about. Her father uh, was locked up at one point uh, at the beginning of the Cultural Revolution, and she came from a big family of 10 kids. And she might very well have stayed in Dongbei for the rest of her life, but she ended up getting into the garbage business. And the garbage business presented a lot of opportunities, one of which was that she discovered that the United States as she put it, was the Saudi Arabia of garbage. We just generated huge amounts of garbage. It poured out of us like you know oil from a geyser. And so um, she started shipping all of this American garbage to China and recycling it, turning it into cardboard boxes, stamped made in China, and then sending them back to us in the United States. And what I thought was so interesting, I went to go see her, and I had all these questions about you know how she made the very risky choices, why she made the choices she made, and sort of what created her. And the first thing she wanted to talk about, I couldn't figure out a why she'd accepted the interview, and then uh, um, and then b what she wanted to talk about. Anyway, we sit down, and I realize the only reason she'd accepted the interview was that she'd seen in in my bio that I went to Harvard, and she wanted to talk about how she could get her kid into Harvard. Uh. And so so we sit down, and she starts, and she spends the first part of the interview sort of asking whether I knew anybody there and whether I would write a reference. And I, <laughs> I said, I'm not sure that's a good way to go. Uh, but you know, I, it, it made a lot of sense to me. I thought it was fascinating, though. Here's somebody who had, in every way, exploited successfully the opportunities within the Chinese system. But her perception of the best way to prepare her kid for the world was get them as far away as I can probably bring them back eventually. In fact, I know she wanted her children to eventually be Chinese, but she wanted to give them this, you know, a foot on dry land, um, and more importantly, a, a set of social connections, and a, probably a place to put some resources that were not in China. Yeah. I was wondering if there was an event or a topic that you really wished you could have written about or reported on, but didn't for one reason or another? Um, well, I mean, publishers are, are brutal authoritarians and they confine you to <laughs> 300 pages. So, um, no, you know, I guess um, uh, there was, well, I'll tell you one kind of silly example, which I probably should have put in the book because it, it I think it does resonate with people who've been to China, but, um, just an example of what it's like sometimes being a foreigner in China. Uh, I initially set out, by the way, to write a book about foreigners in China and then abandon the project right away because I realized they're not the story. We're not the story. We don't matter, actually. And so maybe someday that's a book to write. But <clears throat> I ended up focusing on Chinese stories. Um, but I had an experience when I was a student in China in um, 1996 that they would go around the campuses they, meaning movie producers and TV producers, would go around the campuses asking if people wanted to be in, in a movie or in, in a TV show or something. And the Chinese teachers encouraged this because it was a way to practice your language skills and it would put you into you know, environments that were hard to predict and that was always good for language study. So they encouraged you to go. So I go off to one of these things and they say, we're gonna pay you 20 kwai or something. And so I go and I'm spending the day waiting to be um, pressed into service. And usually, if you're a foreigner, you played the role of like a, you know, a Russian soldier being slaughtered on the battle city, a battlefield or something, um, or a, you know, a, a, a traitorous somebody. Um, so I couldn't figure, I, and I, they weren't calling on me to go do my thing yet, and I couldn't figure out, well, what am I gonna do here? And so we get, to, so then finally, the end of the day comes, and they said, all right, here's a fake mustache. And I said, okay, perfect. I put on my fake mustache. And 
they said, now we want you to go and stand next to this telephone. And what you're going to do is, it's a public phone, and you're going to make a call, and you're going to say, is she there? And you're going to nod your head, and you're going to hang up the phone, and then you're going to look over your shoulder up at the building that's right there. And I said, okay, I can do that. All right. So I do it. I, I think I, you know, performed brilliantly, personally. Um, <coughs> inhabited the role. And then they said, here are your lines for tomorrow and for the second of the two-day um, two uh, shoot. And so I, I go home, and I was like a second-year Chinese student, so I really didn't know that very much at all. But I could sort of start to figure out what was going on. And as I'm reading through the lines, I began to realize that I was playing the role of a sexual predator. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And uh, so by the time I got home to my dorm, I was, I was sort of like, hmm, do I want to go down in Chinese TV history as a, <laughs> as a, sex, as a sexual predator? So, uh, so I did the brave thing, of course, which was that I called in sick <laughs> and never went to the second day of the shoot. And they were not happy about it because they had to reshoot that one scene. They had to reshoot you know, the scene with the telephone and so on. But I think it was a very prudent choice. Um, and uh, that story didn't make it into the book. <laughs> I've since learned that everybody I know who studied Chinese was at one point, you know, approached about being, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> was approached about doing some TV thing. Yeah. It ha happens right in Taiwan, too. Yeah, I'm sure. Can you speak to the military aspirations of China? A lot of people in the United States are fearful, I think, that they're going to overtake us someday or, or threaten us. And I just wanted to know how you felt about that and yeah. what you're doing right now in the South China Sea and sure. Taiwan. Thank um, you. So I, I, you know, as a general orientation, I tend to be of the view that you know, when we worry about China, we sometimes over worry about China, we fixate on things. And I think that's true very much in the short term when it comes to the military, that we're just in another league at the moment. The United States, as I mentioned last night, we have a dozen aircraft carriers. China has one. And our, you know, their military spending is growing fast, but it's still only a fraction of ours in the United States, even if you um, assume that there is some large undeclared portion of military spending. Um, that being said, uh, and also just on a technical basis, uh, they have they don't have the kinds of experience and they don't have the kinds of um, uh, expertise that the United States military has. And, uh, and you saw this uh, even demonstrated in some ways like when they had to evacuate a large number of their citizens from Libya during the fall of Libya. They found themselves way overextended. They had thousands of oil workers and they really had no experience about how do you evacuate people. And that's, a, you know, that's not a kinetic military activity, but it's definitely very much something that the armed forces has to be able to do. Um, they succeeded in doing it, but it was very hard. Medium term and long term, though, I take the threat very seriously in the sense that I think China at this point, um, within security circles, it, there is a pretty strong feeling that the United States and China are headed towards a confrontation. And uh, part of that is that you know, if you are in the business of conceiving Chinese security policy and doctrine, that's what you think about. And so every, you know, everything is a nail, and you are the hammer. That's the only way that you think. On the other hand, uh, you know, the history suggests, and there's a brilliant new book that is just coming out now that really lays this out better than, uh, than, than anybody has, called Thucydides' Trap, if you're interested in this subject. Um, Thucydides' Trap is by Graham Allison from Harvard. And uh, what he, described, and I think it's right, is that Thucydides laid out this parable, I mean a true parable, uh, that in the 5th century BC, um, the rise of Athens surprised the Spartans. They were the incumbent power. They were the, the reigning power. And at the time, it led to conflict, 30 years of conflict that ruined both sides. And since then, Allison and others have identified 15 occasions where you have a similar dynamic, where you have a rising power that jolts uh, an incumbent existing power and uh, threatens their sense of primacy and uh, preeminence. And in that situation, out of those 14 or 15 occasions, it's led to war on 11 occasions. 
And so you can either look at that as uh, destiny uh, and as something that we should be really worried about, or you should, could look at it as a diagnosis of a problem and a problem that we should address immediately. The part that gives me, that, that encourages me and sort of is a reason for optimism is that you hear about Thucydides' trap talked about not only in the U.S. now, but also in Beijing. You know, there is in Chinese security circles, people talk about this problem of history and this, this sort of undertow that is pulling us in that direction. And being aware of it is a very important piece of being able to try to short circuit the process. So in that sense, I'm encouraged because I think even though there is this institutional bias for action that is growing within uh, the Chinese military, uh, boys with toys, you know, they've bought a lot of stuff and developed a lot of gear and haven't had the chance to use it. Uh, even though there is that, there is also a, a, a f there's a, um, there is a, 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 a sober, far-thinking way of talking about the issue that is a lot better than our relationships with other places at the moment. And the last little piece I would add is that we're not, we don't have a baked-in ideological conflict. I don't really buy that. I don't think that the United States, the way that we did during the Cold War, for instance, I just don't see it as us being kind of, you know, inexorably opposed to each other. It doesn't need to be. Lots of questions here. Where are we headed? <laughs> back, back in the corner. Okay, I have a smaller scale question, but it's one that's important to KU because um, Chinese students are really important to us financially, and that's true of other public universities. So um, you mentioned the woman who was trying to uh, work her son into Harvard. Do you have any sense, um, you know, given the slowdown of the economy in China, you know, what are the prospects in the next five to ten years of us continuing to have this influx of Chinese students? It's a really good question. I, I mean, I'll, I'll admit at the outset, I have no idea what will actually, you know, to what degree will economic performance um, affect the outbound um, sort of, you know, outbound educational choices. That being said, I, I, I guess a couple of things are probably true. One is that um, even if you lose two points, three points off the GDP, there's just a huge number of people that will still have the opportunity, they still have the money to be able to go overseas, and uh, more importantly, they still have the desire. So as long as the United States remains open and available and retains the credibility and prestige, that we've had, then that's not going to dry up. Um, it's just, you know, it's not, uh, there's just so many people who want to go. And we remain still almost in a class by ourselves when it comes to the reputation within China of an American degree. And, um, but, you know, I also, I, you know, I, I would hasten to add that that's a perishable asset. And if we screw that up in a whole, you know, in a lot of ways, um, they will go to Australia and New Zealand and the UK. Um, but for the moment, I think it's probably a reliable bet. I'm wondering, with your language, your experience, and your knowledge, has our current administration asked for help, as difficult as that might be for you? Uh, are they going to take advantage of all you have to offer? I'm not sure that I'm their favorite guy. Um, <laughs> but I understand I, I, it would be difficult. <laughs> a couple of things I think. Uh, one is the um, there's the reasons for and against you, what is such a crucial and huge question, which is are they pursuing expertise? Um, there has been in the early stages so far a resistance to bringing in people whose principal attribute is that they know something, not that they believe in something. Um, and this is one of the reasons why a lot of these jobs are not filled. Um, there's been a political litmus test. I know a couple of people who have been approached for jobs and were, were asked creepy questions about their politics that made them run for the hills. That being said, the guy who is in the catbird seat on China policy at the National Security Council is somebody named Matt Pottinger who is really good and is uh, not a political person. He's a political appointee. As a practical matter, he was brought in um, uh, but is really good, and that gives me reason to be encouraged. So, um, yeah, I don't think this is the administration for me, uh, <laughs> but 
Um, over time, my hunch is that over time, they will get past this period of believing that you can define your your ecosystem entirely by political fidelity and actually realize, well, it turns out you have to know things. Uh, but in the beginning, they were they, they weren't opting into that view. It's kind of a better better uh, read than expert mentality. Yes. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It really is better read. Take, than takes us back to 1950s yeah. China. And look how that worked out. It was so very well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, the administration has to deal with North Korea, and given yep. China's complicated relationship with North Korea, any ideas as where mm -hmm. this is headed? Yeah, a couple of interesting things that didn't get a whole lot of attention. Um, at the very beginning of, the, of this administration, uh, a friend of mine who's a real North Korea expert, uh, an American who lives in Seoul, and was visiting the U.S. This was a few days after the inauguration, and he came in to visit, he was staying with, with, uh, staying with us at our house, and he was there to talk to, to sort of brief a bunch of U.S. agencies. And he said, you know, it's a little premature to talk about it, but you'll see they're, they're actually, believe it or not, the Trump administration is going to try to do a back channel. They are already trying to do a back channel discussion with North Korea. And I said, that sounds totally like nonsense to me, and I think you're just a hopeless optimist. And it's partly, he's a big rapprochement guy, thinks that we can have a more reasonable relationship with North Korea than we do. But sure enough, he was right. And there was this early effort uh, to try to open a, a back channel, a sort of track two, maybe track 2.5. I mean, really not government officials, but <clears throat> some way of trying to get these two governments to talk to each other and try to get them into conversation. And it failed because Kim Jong-un killed his brother in the airport with nerve gas, which is always a, always kills the mood at a party. <laughs> and um, so that tells me one thing, which is that they were at least ideologically open to the idea that we can have a very different relationship. You know, uh, the president has a pretty crude understanding of history, but one thing he has picked up is the idea of Nixon to China, that in a way you can, you know, the big bet that you can go outside of your ideological comfort zone and I think maybe get, uh, get a big win out of it. So somebody talked him into this and it was a reasonable idea and it was a reasonable thing to pursue. What's, what's, a, what's unfortunate is that we've also learned pretty quickly that there is no doctrine here. Uh, there certainly wasn't doctrine when it came to Syria that you know, the idea that there was a, a coherent view of how the United States should conduct itself in Syria really didn't last very long. Um, and I don't think there's doctrine on North Korea. So I think it's really, um, he's sort of being pushed in one direction or the other. And that's the issue that worries me absolutely the most right now, because uh, it's not, a, an, it's not a, an arena in which you can be impulsive and um, threatening and casual. And those are three things that he is. And so when you get onto Twitter and you say, uh, kind of threats to North Korea, I mean, Quite literally, somebody is coming into Kim Jong-un's office and reading him a, Co a Korean translation of Donald Trump's tweets. Now, if that shouldn't keep you up at night, I don't know what, what it does. Um, but uh, so I, I think we're heading into, into kind of rocky waters with this. The question, which is about China, is, is China going to behave differently? I, I would have said two weeks ago that I didn't think China was, there was really much of anything short of a sign of imminent collapse in Pyongyang that would drive China to reorient its posture towards North Korea. But I am willing to admit, and I say this with obviously no great love for the president, that I think that um, attacking Syria while Xi Jinping was sitting at his hip had a clarifying effect uh, in Xi Jinping's mind on what the United States might be willing to do. And for that reason, it's possible that it does change the chemistry. I just don't know. Um, so, I mean, it, but I'm being analytically on, honest when I say I think they may have ambled into a, into a, a breakthrough. Um, I'm currently doing a research project in, about over human rights and the progression of human rights in China. And I know that uh, human rights is a culturally subjective turn, especially when speaking about the East and the West. But with your years in China, what was the, your interaction with the general public or like the social climate can about human rights? It's a great question and I, 
you know, I'll tell you one thing. I know you, you were right and kind of responsible to hedge at the outset by saying human rights is culturally defined and so on. However, I, you know, I've thought about that for a long time and actually come to the view that, no, I think certain things we can announce them to be universal uh, and that it's not as if, you know, a culture can sort of opt out of just the most elementary protections of its own people, as evidenced by the fact that the Chinese constitution is pretty good on the subject of human rights. And so I often found when I would have a, you know, a debate with a Chinese friend about this subject that, you know, I would sort of resort to the Chinese constitution and say, but, you know, it says right here that X, Y, and Z are true and that individuals are entitled to free exercise of religion and they're entitled to free press and so on. So, you know, there is some part of the Chinese political brain that acknowledges that these are the ultimate ends of government and that's where they need to be. Um, and it's really a debate about to what degree is China ready for those things. I would say that in, in the, at the moment, the term human rights has been um, poisoned in the Chinese mind by years of, of, uh, of talking it down and by framing it as, a, as an assault on China's development and uh, ability to, to function as a state. So for that reason, you know, if, if we were sitting in Beijing, um, a lot of people who might otherwise have a lot of views that would be recognizable from a Western political sense, they're allergic to the idea of human rights just because it's taken on such a negative connotation. So I often usually, if I want to talk about it, I just skip the term and go around it and talk about something else. Talk about justice or talk about fairness or talk about um, sanctity of the body. These kind of terms which are divorced from the vocabulary still accomplish some of the same purposes. You can still talk about them. Um, I, I found this when I was writing uh, Age of Ambition, that in the very beginning, I started talking to people about, well, I'm looking at individualism in China, and I realized that was a big mistake, because individualism uh, as an idea is a very Western concept, you know, um, as, a, as, a, as a sort of ism is just, was really the wrong thing. But then I realized if you talked about individualization or versions of that kind of term, people were fine with it and they didn't have any problem with it. Uh, and so that was a useful, it was kind of a, a lesson in how a, a subtle shift in the way that you frame it can actually open up an opportunity for a conversation. Yeah, the last economist, there is an article about the po coastal provinces uh, having inputs and uh, linkages uh, to uh, Vietnam and, uh, and uh, Indonesia and so on, instead of the interior. Now, my question is how a, a huge province uh, uh, with important political uh, st strengths there, like the Suchin Basin, <laughs> would, would react to this or uh, buses in the interior mm. compared to this globalization parts of, of the Chinese economy. Thank so, you. in a sense, how would the Sichuan Basin respond to these coastal provinces being more oriented well, towards Southeast Asia? Of China. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I don't actually know. I don't know how they would respond to it. I, I guess it, it, you've identified an important development, which is that there is very much a feeling uh, along the southern coastal provinces that they have um, more uh, uh, economic linkage to Southeast Asia than they do to particularly northern and inland um, provinces. Um, but I, I don't know uh, how, the, how they sort of interact with each other. I think if I'm going to guess, I would say probably that the central government is uh, inclined to allow a little bit of competition and let these places compete. Um, you know, this is something Xi Jinping talks about competition as a concept he wants to promote. It's never really taken hold very well. But I think they're, you know, it's conceivable to me that they could allow different places to define for themselves what it is that they, sort of, who they want to be their natural partners. Um, but I, I'm afraid I don't have any more text around that. Was there, was there another hand? I, well, I, I, I oh, Jane. Yeah. You go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I've got to finish my bite. <laughs> <laughs> Called the Danish exception, because mm -hmm. you're the Danish. Well, this is, this is a question that sort of, I think, connects to several different things that you've said. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering what you think China's, um, China's perception of its own leadership role in, in the region and the world might be. You know, where, where, yeah. where is China going as a leader? 
Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Partly because the Chinese self per, self identity as a leader is is really polarized. Because in the same thought, um, somebody will describe China as as a natural world leader. Uh, you know, we've ha ever thus we have always been. And then at the same time, they will describe tremendous weakness and the you know the sense that we are put upon and that there are all of these reasons. Um, you know, f because of history and because of discrimination, that we will never be the leader. And it, it's interesting that they coexist that way. And I, I, I wish I actually, you've raised an interesting question too, which is, you know, if you could sit down with a, um, with a Qing emperor, would that person have expressed some of the same ambivalence? Or uh, w would there be a more kind of coherent theory? I guess today, um, I basically think that uh, Chinese leaders imagine that they should be and will be uh, the preeminent power in the Asian Pacific region. It's just that's, I think they consider that an inevitability. It's just a pacing issue. Um, the bigger question is do they imagine themselves being global leaders, truly the sort of the, the leader around the world? I'm not sure they want that. Uh, I mentioned a little, I sort of flicked at it last night, but. Um, you know, I think that maybe they imagine they will get there somewhere, some at some point. It's a long way off. It seems like that you know the engagement with Africa, for example, sure. is it, which which is multifaceted yep. and, and 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 has a lot to do with you know straight out economic Resources. benefit, right? But but that there there do seem to be ways in which China is seeking to demonstrate a leadership capacity there. Yeah, I, I guess part of it, I mean, as we've learned over the course of the last few months, is that these things don't exist in a vacuum, and that their perception of their leadership potential and responsibility reflects partly our own withdrawal. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, would Xi Jinping have given the speech at the World Economic Forum that he gave had the United States not been expressing all of this um, desire to pull out of international commitments or reduce our expenditure and so on? Maybe not. You know, maybe it's sort of he feels called upon. On Africa questions, and I mean, you do absolutely, and you also see China participating, for instance, now in global peacekeeping efforts on a level that it never did before, right. which is almost even, you know, it gets you out of the, the sort of uh, mercantilist framework of Latin America and Africa and begins to get into questions of moral leadership. You know, to, the thing I think that I've always returned to when I'm sort of puzzling out this puzzle, this question of how much will China want to be that player is that China is not, doesn't have a philosophical facility to become a destination nation. It's not a place where you go. You don't become Chinese. So, I mean, you quite literally just can't become Chinese, even if you're somebody who moved there as a fellow traveler in the 40s and has lived there ever since. I mean, I, found, I think that's a magazine story waiting to be written, are these you know co former communists, or some still communists, who moved to China because they believed and now find themselves without even, like they're, they're not Chinese citizens, they, they, they may not even be able to stay there long term. That's an amazing fact and perhaps the single greatest distinction between the United States and China. Um, and for that, as I think as long as you're not able to become uh, a place that people aspire to join, well then it's hard to project, to go back to our very first sort of discussion today, which is that moral charisma of being a place that others define as a leader rather than you just announcing yourself as a leader. Um, so Evan, are you still free to travel to China? Even, so. oh okay, <laughs> you, you didn't get an uh, invitation to a tea conversation? <laughs> no, uh, but I, they are very wary of for, former journalists. This is like the most radioactive category. Uh, people who were, uh, Correspondents in Beijing for a long time uh, and then want to come back. So uh, when I go back, it has to be under, uh, I have to be, there's a lot of different circumstances that you, under which you can go back. So sometimes I'll go back as a tourist, for instance, and just, not if I'm there to work, but if I'm there just to see people. And that's always useful too. Um, but they're pretty wary. Is your book translated into China? Not on the mainland. It's translated and published in Taiwan and Hong Kong. Okay. This was a choice. I made a, okay. I made a choice about um, 
how to handle the problem of censorship. Yeah. And I decided not to publish it in mainland China, even though there would be a lot of reasons to do so. It's nice to be able to have the book available. Uh, I mean, just as a, as a blunt matter, there's a lot of readers in China who would be interested in Western books by Western writers about China have become very popular. Nonfiction books have become very popular. So some publishers had approached me about publishing it on the mainland. And my view was, I spent a lot of time in this book writing about the effects of censorship and the kind of moral offense of it. And, and you it, used real names. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It would have been, and they were okay with it. Everybody knew I was publishing their okay. work and they always assumed that their stuff would be, they always knew that, I always explained, you know, this is going to be out on the internet, it'll be in China as soon as it's out in the US. That didn't, that really wasn't the concern so much. It was more about the idea that if I published a book in which I agreed to remove things that were, um, that a Chinese publishing house acting in effect as its own censor, that they wanted me to remove, that was making a big mistake because it was um, signaling to the Chinese reader, these things don't matter, I'm willing to excise them from history, that would be a real crime in my view. Did you get an um, invitation for um, speech in mainland um, universities? Yeah, I have. Uh, it tends to be though that the, um, so when I lived in China, I would do it a fair amount. Since then, it tends to be it'll be a, a, a foreign university's program in China will invite me to come over. Mm -hmm. um, but it's always interesting. I get interviewed by Chinese media sometimes, and I usually say yes if it's, a, uh, a media organization that I think is responsible. If they do, you know, if they, if they monkey around with your quotes and they make you say things that you didn't actually say, then it's not a good idea to encourage them by participating. But if it's like Tsai Xin, for instance, which I think is really good, um, I did an interview with them last week because I, I think it's only fair for one thing. I interviewed a lot of Chinese journalists over the course of my work, and for me to say no would be, uh, would be hypocrisy, but. Yeah. And since you are a media person, uh, what's your view on the government's um, control over WeChat? It is um, the, the biggest uh, social media in China. Um, and um, the, the interesting thing is um, you can form chat rooms yeah. uh, very quickly. And um, there's uh, no cost for you to communicate from uh, every part of the world with your friends in China, uh, even with video calls, it's all free. Um, so that's a big phenomenon. I have a lot of circles on WeChat. Yeah. Some are very pro-government, mm. pro-party, and some are you know, like a Christian circles, yeah. like um, even a little bit anti-government circles. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, a lot of uh, you know, live discussions and sometimes clashes, yeah. uh, and government I mean, does have some monitoring and censoring. Um, some keywords, if show up, um, the posting will be take off within days. Yeah. And people have figured out ways to circumvent that. Mm -hmm. You know, they use uh, acronyms or, you know, uh, other phrases to, you know, uh, avoid government's uh, surveillance. Um, so what do you think? Would that cause any change um, in um, in the way government, uh, you know, try to unify, try to control uh, the individual's ambition, individual's opinion? Yeah, it's a great phenomenon. I mean, as a, it's it really transforms the political ingredients in China. The advent of social media. I, I mean, I, I'll, a couple of things come to mind. One is it's interesting to compare WeChat to Weibo, which was. The predecessor, uh, it's you know still exists, but Weibo was uh, people who remember a few years ago. Um, you know it, the difference between WeChat and Weibo was that Weibo was like Twitter, where you were putting it out and anybody in the world could see it. Basically, WeChat is more like neighborhoods in which you define these sort of more local ecosystems. So it's you and your friends, or you know I'm in some WeChat groups for different reasons. So one will be a group of China scholars focused on one issue, another issue, another will be a group of friends. And, um, or you know, I'll go to a conference and everybody from the conference will create a WeChat group and then stay in touch. So in that sense, it does achieve a, a pretty powerful social function that just didn't exist before. I guess the thing that I find interesting is that the government was more sophisticated about this than I expected in the sense that they realized 
we can't shut down social media entirely. People will go berserk. But what we can do is um, curtail it to some degree. And so that's one of the reasons why WeChat ended up prevailing over Weibo because Weibo was kind of hobbled and they, you know, they got rid of some of the most influential people, some of the most provocative people. And as a result, you ended up with a, a more, you know, if I was being unkind, I'd say that WeChat is a sort of toothless version. I don't actually think it's quite that toothless um, because it generates still opportunities for conversation. But it's a managed form of, um, it's, a managed, it's a managed conversation. It's not that it exists utterly without, um, without control. But, I, you know, they've been, this is one of the, one of the realizations for me over the last 10 years has been, I would have assumed five years ago, for instance, that the line that Bill Clinton had 20 some odd years ago was basically right, which is that trying to control the internet, he was talking about China when he said it, that trying to control the internet is like trying to nail jello to the wall and that it's a foolish thing to do, it won't work and it'll end up, um, you know, in the end you have to allow the internet to sort of grow organically beyond its, uh, without trying to prevent it. Actually, it turns out China has succeeded in managing the nature and the boundaries of the internet. And uh, I don't say that with pleasure. It actually, I think, is a detriment to Chinese thought and innovation. But they have succeeded in doing it to a degree I hadn't anticipated. I thought they weren't going to be able to. Yeah, we use uh, VPN a lot to jump the firewall yeah. when we were in China. Yeah, all the time in China. I mean, and it's harder too. Sometimes the VPNs get shut down, and then you're really <laughs> trapped. You know, you're like, all of a sudden it's 1995, and you're sitting there again. Um, so, yeah, I, I um, in some ways, I, I kind of think that the full force and power of the internet doesn't reveal itself until there's a crisis. And if there is a crisis, all of a sudden we'll know actually to what degree has the internet created the habits of mind and the physical infrastructure to allow people to be in touch in ways that would be a political challenge. But in a, in a normal state, in a kind of steady state, um, it's hard to know. What about uh, China and Latin America? China has been investing, especially in the oil and mining sectors, in uh, loans, and in countries like Ecuador, uh, they own the oil production for the next 10 or 20 years. So it's sort of, uh, if we, we can say, like an economic uh, colonization or something. So how do you see the path of Latin America, this relationship, dependency, or this is related to your question? Yeah. Well, I've heard different versions from friends in Latin America who are sort of confronting this question. And, you know, oftentimes when you hear about it in the U.S., it's being used as a bit of a cudgel to try to remind American policymakers that as you pull away and if you stop investing and if you stop providing a kind of robust linkage, China will step in and, and take over. But I, I really do hear a lot of hesitation and there's a lot of local concern about the role of Chinese influence in countries all over Latin America and the Caribbean. So if you go, you know, everywhere, there's, oftentimes the conversation follows a very similar arc, which is in the beginning they say, have you seen all of the glorious new roads and hospitals and all the buildings with the blue roofs? You know, those are always built by China. And then the second conversation is a little bit later where people say, but I feel very uncomfortable with this level of Chinese influence. And, um, I don't know exactly. I think probably in the end um, they'll end up being realistic, complex relationships that have both a lot of dividends for the for both sides, um, but are also greeted with a lot of wariness and resistance. So I've never thought that it ends as conveniently as just being a, a kind of neo-colonialism. It's just too hard to imagine. Um, but I, I think in some cases one of the things that you discover is that China finds that building these relationships are not cost-free transactions. There's, there's a lot of, it's hard to maintain a long-running positive relationship with a country from which you are extracting resources if you're not providing a realistic uh, response. So, um, yeah, um, it's a, a mixed picture, I would say. Are there other questions about China? Because oh. mine's not about China. <laughs> 
Well, you write about a lot of other interesting things. So I just wondered, particularly um, some of the articles in the New Yorker, um, I'm thinking of the one particularly about the wealthy survivalists. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can you tell us what you're working on now? Uh, yeah, I guess secret? I'm supposed to. Well, I'll tell you, uh, <coughs> the, um, I'm, at the very moment, I'm working on a story about, about Trump, uh, which I can't say too much about other than to say that it's an exercise in what I would call informed projection, which is trying to see where things are going. Not making reckless predictions, but trying to understand where it's going. This was inspired by a project that last summer uh, wrote a story that at the time we thought was kind of a fanciful exercise called Trump's First Term, um, which was published <laughs> in, in September. And uh, it seemed, well, maybe this is a foolish thing to do, but it turns out actually if you talk to people, and uh, talk to enough people, who have reasons to really understand how things evolve, you can get a pretty good sense of where things are going. And I think some of that applies now uh, as far as where this administration is headed. So uh, I'll be writing a story in the New Yorker pretty soon that, that maps out where we think it's going. Then the next project is probably gonna be about North Korea. So I was glad to talk about that today. So um, yeah, I may be heading to North Korea. My wife has uh, advised me that if uh, when, the, when I go, I should make sure to come back. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good plan. Yeah. She's not going. She's not going, yeah, I think uh, one is enough, we figure. Sally, were you, uh, were you giving me the cutoff sign or do you want to ask a question? No, but we probably have time for one more question, if anyone has one more. Why is that a real traditional academic question as opposed to pragmatic? Yeah. But, but with the air so bad in China, with the water so bad and so much polluted, you know, that traditional thought of the mandate of heaven, it, what, I mean, you see the unrest growing in the poorer people, like you're just not taking care of our basic needs. So whether you call it the mandate of heaven or not, do you see the kind of unrest growing from that kind of, you know, we don't have clean air, we don't have clean water, we worry where our fish come from that we eat, we worry about our kids and the diseases they deal with. And you see, you read about more unrest when you're in China. Yeah. Do, do you see that growing, or is that just too academic, traditional of a question? No, I think it's not too academic. I think it's very much the relevant question, and it's the question that the Chinese leadership asks itself. You know, a couple of years ago, Wang Tishan, who runs the uh, anti-corruption campaign, was telling friends they should be reading de Tocqueville. And he was telling them to read de Tocqueville because one of the things that you learn is that countries lose their political, regimes lose their political grip, not when people are at the very bottom, but once they've moved up a little bit and mm -hmm. all of a sudden their reality doesn't keep up with their expectations. And he wanted everybody in Beijing to remember that. And so uh, that, at the same time, I have been impressed, um, I mean that in a value neutral way, I've been uh, surprised by the degree to which Xi Jinping has been able to change the narrative course of the country over the course of the last five years. It was moving in a direction after Hu Jintao, very much in the sense of drifting towards a, a sort of, um, a sense of leaderlessness, that there was, Hu Jintao was a, a pallid figure and everybody felt like, well, maybe the mandate of heaven really has been lost. And then Xi Jinping, uh, and I should add, I'm not in any way kind of dignifying his authoritarian tendencies or anything like that, but he did come into office and um, forcefully remind people that there is uh, a leadership that believes that it deserves to rule. And people, in some ways, responded to that. You know, they may not have felt the tangible improvement in their lives. The, the, the fish may still have three eyes, but, um, but on some level, they felt that at least somebody was minding the shop. And that may have bought, them, uh, bought the leadership more time in order to try to actually address the real grievances.